have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Yasmin Butt. She's an anatomic pathologist with the subspecialty expertise in pulmonary and cardiac pathology. Her clinical focus includes interstitial lung disease, lung cancer, transplant pathology, cardiovascular pathology. She's interested in education, and she is the current chair of the DLMP Educations Committee and recently published a textbook, Atlas of Pulmonary Pathology, First Edition, A Pattern-Based Approach. Thank you so much. So I think I know the answer to this question, but I feel like I need to ask it. Are there any other pathologists in this room? <laughs> Nope, just me. Okay. Well, thank you so much for the invitation, and I'm going to talk to you today about the role of biopsy. It's been mentioned in almost every lecture, so let's uh, let's talk about the let's talk about the actual biopsies. Unlike many people here, I have no disclosures. Okay, so we'll talk about how to recognize amyloid uh, in tissues, and then the histologic differential of amyloidosis for us from the pathology side, as well as some of the challenges that we face. And I'm also going to touch on light chain deposit disease, which I think has been briefly mentioned once or twice today, uh, and then briefly talk about um, hereditary uh, TTR amyloidosis. So we've already talked about this, so I don't need to belabor this point, but amyloid is a misfolded protein that deposits in tissues, and that is not a good thing. There are lots of different types. Uh, you just heard a lot about uh, AL uh, light chain, uh, and that's uh, one of the most common that you see across all uh, organs, and here are a couple of other types listed here, but there are many more amyloid types that exist. So you might think, okay, you sent the biopsy, it's easy, right? It's kind of a black box, like you, you send the tissue somewhere and then you get a report back afterwards. Um, it's actually not always the case. So sometimes it's an unexpected finding. So I think one of the one of the themes that I have seen arising out of the lectures today is that there's lots of different clinical symptoms that may eventually lead to a diagnosis of amyloidosis, but you're not necessarily thinking about it right away. And someone may have a GI biopsy for their diarrhea, uh, but they're not thinking about amyloid, right? So for the pathologist on the other end, especially if when you, the clinician, are seeing the patient, you're not thinking about amyloid, we might not be thinking about it either. And sometimes on the actual tissue, the finding of amyloid can be extremely focal and can just blend into the background, especially if you're thinking about something from another side. I'll use GI biopsy again as an example. Uh, you're thinking, oh, this patient has diarrhea, I'm worried about inflammatory bowel disease, I'm looking for architectural distortion. You might miss the little slips of amyloid that are in the submucosa. So amyloid can be seen, of course, in any organ or any tissue, uh, so it can be unexpected. Um, and there are mimics. There are things that look like amyloid. Uh, one of those is light chain deposit disease, which I'll talk at the end. And there are other things, too, that look like amyloid that actually aren't. Uh, and then interpretation of the special stains like Congo Red can actually be technically challenging, especially if you don't have experience or you're someone who only orders it once every six months, once a year, once every five years. All right, so that initial tissue diagnosis, there are a couple of stains that I wanted to mention. So the first, of course, is Congo red. So when we have something that's Congo red, we want to see Congophilia, okay? So we want to see uh, this kind of pinkish red color, all right? In this particular case, this is a myocardium wrapped around the myocyte. And then when we put it under cross-polarized light, we want to see apple green birefringence, okay? So here's a nice example of that. You can see that nice apple green birefringence. This is actually quite beautiful under the microscope. It's extremely challenging to take photos of, so they always look really, really dark and not very pretty, uh, but it's actually very nice under the microscope. Uh, another stain I wanted to talk about was sulfated alcium blue. So this is a stain you might not hear about as much, um, and this will stain uh, amyloid in this very nice teal green, almost like a toothpaste, like that old toothpaste color. And then trichrome stains will train, uh, stain amyloid uh, in a gray, uh, grayish blue color. This is more of a, a blue, but it also has, can sometimes have more of a grayish tint. So those are the basic special stains that we use uh, for amyloid recognition uh, in tissue. So let's talk about the heart. So cardiac involvement, of course, as many people have said uh, today, is very important for the prognosis of how these patients perform. Uh, many different types can be in the heart. Uh, AL and ATTR are, of course, uh, amongst the most common. So let's look at an example. So here's uh, an endomyocardial biopsy. And actually, can I, does this come off? Nope, it doesn't. Okay. Um, so this is an endomyocardial biopsy. All right, so, whoops, go back. So this would be the endomyocardium, all right? So if this was still in the patient, this is where the blood would be in the, in the chamber. And then underneath here are all the myocytes. So I've given you an inset here on the right, a little bit higher power, sorry, I <laughs> got laser in your eye. Um, and these are what myocytes should look like, okay? You shouldn't have really anything in between them. But if you look at this here, you start to see, well, okay, this is a cell, this is a nucleus, 
And then there's all this amorphous material around it, all right? And it has this almost like a little cracked structure. It's very light, light pink color. Uh, this is one of our standard stains is a hematoxylin and eosin. Everything that comes through surgical pathology is put with this stain. Uh, and you, you start to see that, okay, well, I wonder why this patient, I don't wonder why this patient might be having uh, trouble uh, and cardiac symptoms because instead of a solid sheet of myocytes, we're seeing all this material replacing uh, those myocytes. So if we go to, and, and here's another piece. This is actually, I wanted to show you the second piece because this is from the same biopsy, and it's a little less obvious, I think, compared to that last biopsy, uh, where you see more myocytes and maybe a hint of something going on, but I could see someone who wasn't used to looking at these types of biopsies, and if this was what most of the specimen looked like, looked at it really quickly, they might miss uh, this material that's edging in around the edges there. Okay, so I'm gonna start off with the sulfated alcium blue stain, all right? And this is a very nice stain for uh, screening, and it can pick up very small amounts of amyloid very easily. So again, so our myocytes are, are this orange color here, and then you're seeing the sulfated alcium blue is all of this green, just almost completely overtaking this piece of tissue. All right, and there's that other piece you can see now, it's really obvious. There's green everywhere where there shouldn't be green. So the amyloid becomes very obvious on this stain. Um, I'll say I really like this stain. Um, we use this at Mayo uh, for essentially all of our cases, uh, but not, a, not all labs have this stain or are proficient in, in uh, using it for this purpose. All right, so here's the Congo Red. Okay, and again, it looks kind of similar to the H&E because there's so much amyloid in this particular uh, example, but it's a little more pink, a little, little more pinkish red. So let's polarize that tissue there, and then now we can see all of our, all of our uh, green there, that kind of characteristic apple green birefringence. All right, so this is a nice case um, because there is quite a lot of amyloid um, but it's not often the case. Sometimes you see just a little bit of amyloid or your biopsy isn't as generous as those that our wonderful cardiologists uh, send our way. Uh, and so you may have trouble seeing the little bits. And one thing I also wanted to point out here is you see the apple green birefringence. And even in this case where there's a ton of amyloid, not every piece of amyloid is actually staining. And so that's something that I think people miss sometimes. It's not every single bit. It's, it's, it's a polarization. It's a physical polarization of how the light is refracting through that amyloid. So you don't always see the green green absolutely everywhere. Uh, and when you have small specimens, this can be incredibly challenging. Okay, so we have amyloid, now what? Um, typing is, of course, very important for patient management, has been uh, talked about in multiple talks today. There's lots of methods. Um, there's IHC, immunofluorescence, um, electron microscopy. Um, I will say probably the two most common ones I see people use are the mass strec, mass spec, uh, which is what we do at Mayo. We send it up to Rochester, and then IHC. Um, IHC has a lot of issues associated with it. It's not always sensitive. It's not always specific. There can be a lot of background. There can be false positives. There can be false negatives. Honestly, I, I would advocate against using IHC in identification of amyloid typing. So if that is what your pathologist is doing in your institution or where the lab where you're sending your samples, um, try recommending or asking, you know, could we actually send this for mass spec typing? Um, I think it's a far superior uh, system, and I have, seen, I have seen multiple cases where the IHC led some down the wrong road, and then when we actually typed it, uh, you get the correct diagnosis. Um, very sensitive, very specific. I'm always incredibly impressed with the amount uh, of tiny amounts of amyloid that they can pull out uh, with their microdissection techniques in order to run mass spec. So I would highly recommend that you use max spec for typing rather than IHC or some of these uh, additional methods. All right, so I would consider this to be the gold standard. All right, so for that particular case, the patient had transthyretin type. Uh, this patient ended up getting a uh, lung trans, or lung, it's lungs on my mind, a uh, heart transplant. And this is a cross section, a short access cross section of what we're seeing from this patient's uh, explanted heart. And at first uh, glance, when you look at this, you might think, well, well, probably for this group, you're not going to think this is normal. But if I'm not talking to pathology residents and, and other trainees, I say, oh, it looks kind of normal. Um, but it's actually not. So you have a diffuse thick thickening. Of, of, of the myocardium here. And you might think, well, is, is it hypertrophic because they have you know, coronary artery disease? But then when you look at the coronaries, they're really clear and open. There's nothing going on there. Of course, you can get amyloid deposition in vessels. Um, so let's look at a little bit higher, uh, I'll take a piece here. All right, so uh, this is that piece. And you can see, even on low power, you know, uh, this is where the blood would be. You can see some blood that's left there. You have this mottled look to it. All right, certainly not what normal myocardium should look like on H&E. And all of those lighter pink areas uh, is our amyloid deposition. 
Okay, and you can see just kind of wrapping around the, the myocytes. So really when you, when you get this kind of visceral look at what amyloid looks like in tissues, it doesn't surprise you that these patients have clinical symptoms. Okay, so let's move to another organ. So 65 year old man, had history of hypertension, GERD, obesity, obstructive sleep apnea. He was endorsing progressive shortness of breath and he was found on imaging to have multiple bilateral pulmonary nodules. So they eventually decided to do a biopsy on this case, and this is the biopsy. This is a needle core biopsy of one of those nodules. All right. So when you look at this, you're like, okay, well, I don't think that's lung. Is it lung? It just looks like this solid mass of pink. Um, there's a few giant cells. There's some inflammation, all the little blue dots are lymphocytes, and a little bit of more normal lung here on the side, but even that has some evidence of hemorrhage going on right there. All right, so it's a light pink mass. Not too much cellularity, it's not cancer, right? Always a concern with patients is a carcinoma. Uh, so what are we gonna do next? So when this, when this case comes across to my desk, uh, I'm going to want to identify what that material is. So when we see this material, which of course, as you all can probably guess, is going to end up being amyloid, uh, there are other things though that we have to consider that are much more common. So necrosis can be very similar in appearance, fibrosis, so collagen fibrosis, some kind of scarring, uh, and then of course amyloid, and then very rarely you might think about light chain deposit disease. So these are some examples of what some of these deferentials might look like. So on the upper left, you have necrosis. This is in a lung biopsy. Necrosis has a little bit more of a granular falling apart appearance in contrast to amyloid, which has more of a cracked, almost like little sheet-like look. Uh, fibrosis in the upper right. So again, this is, a, I apologize, there's a lot of lung in here. Um, so, whoops, go back. All right, so here's fibrosis. So kind of similar to amyloid in that it's pink, but it, you can see that collagen substructure uh, in fibrosis. Here's an example of amyloid in the lung, okay? And then this is what light chain deposit disease looks like. It's very similar to amyloid, but it's a little bit more eosinophilic. Okay, so we'll do our next step. We'll do some stains, a Congo red, sulfated alcium blue. Uh, we'll do what I call our, our special stains to look for bugs. So AFB, azeal Nilsen stain, we'll look for acid fast bacilli, uh, and then GMS to look for fungus. So here's that sulfated alcium blue showing that very characteristic teal color, all right? And then there's our Congo red. This is a nice example of Congo, what we call Congophilia. So it's not enough to see something that looks like it might be polarizing. And that's a point I wanna bring out here as one of the technical challenges is collagen, for example, will give you a little bit of polarized look. It'll look kind of refractile. And you might convince yourself that, is there a little touch of green there? Maybe that's what it is. Um, but it's important that you're actually looking at Congophilic material. And then that is what polarizes to show you the apple green birefringent. So it's not just one thing. You need to see both in order to feel confident in diagnosing uh, amyloid on uh, using this Congo red stain. All right, so there's our polarization. Lots and lots of apple green birefringence there. All right. So this was a patient that we diagnosed with nodular amyloid. It's a lo more localized form, turned out to be a AL type. Here's another example. Um, this is actually a very recent case that I had. Um, again, patient had a nodule in the lung and the needle core biopsy was almost completely uh, uh, replaced by this pale amorphous material. And one thing I hope that um, is coming across in the photos, now all of these photos, most of these photos are a combination of in-house cases and, and consultation cases. So you can see there's a variability in what the stains look like and the colors. So it's not just a reflection of how they're, they're projecting, that's the reality. So every lab is gonna look a little bit different. And so where you train, just thinking about pathologists in, in general practice, where you trained what the few cases of amyloid you may have seen, it may look a little bit different than when you actually go into practice or if you move jobs. Um, so amyloid looks a little bit different depending on, on what lab it's, it's uh, being uh, uh, looked at in. So here's a trichrome, all right? So I mentioned trichrome earlier, and you may say, why are you doing such a general fibrosis stain? And I'll get to that in a minute. Um, and this trichrome on that same case is gonna show you this nice blue color. And I liked this picture because it also nicely highlighted that kind of cracked look, almost like a fish scale look that you can sometimes see uh, in amyloid. All right, there's our sulfated alcium blue. Again, that very nice uh, teal toothpaste color. And then our Congo red. All right, so it's not as Congophilic. You know, the other stains fit, it's not as Congophilic. And you polarize it and you're like, um, is there a little bit of green right there? 
You know, sometimes you honestly just need to turn the lights off in your office and turn the light way up on your microscope and play around with the fine focus to actually see that apple green birefringence. So this is actually more common than not in many cases. So even in a case like this, where there is so much amyloid, it's like nodular deposits of amyloid, it doesn't actually refract very well, and that's not uncommon. And that's what leads to some of these false negatives or equivocal stains that you might get. And you're like, well, everything fits. You're calling it equivocal. If you don't have the experience to call something, um, you might miss something. All right, so this patient ended up uh, having uh, indolent B-cell lymphoma, which is often the case with a nodular uh, amyloid deposition in the lung. Okay, so in the lung in particular, it can be quite subtle. It's important to always keep it in mind. You can have systemic or nodule, uh, nodular forms in the lung. I won't go over this table, um, but essentially when you have diffuse septal amyloidosis, you're going to think about an underlying systemic amyloidosis versus nodular. You might think more uh, about uh, an indolent uh, B-cell lymphoma or something associated with that. So, you know, when I talk to our trainees, I say, okay, if you find nodular, a nodular amyloid deposition, the next thing you need to do is look for the lymphoma, right? So that's the second thing we do is a whole stain panel to see if there are uh, a lymphoma around. Is it kappa predominant, lambda predominant? What's going on? Okay, so next patient, 73-year-old man, increasing shortness of breath. And here is our biopsy. Very short. Not going to go too much into the details of the, the clinical side of things. Um, but this is what his biopsy looked like. So this is lung, all right? So these empty spaces here are where uh, air would be, and then these are those al thin, de delicate alveolar septa where air exchange happens, all right? So this is where the magic happens, okay? Um, I know I'm talking to a group of cardiologists, but this is where the magic happens. <laughs> um, all right, but there's a little bit, there's something going on here. This is actually not quite as thin and delicate as you expect. This is probably closer to normal. You can see there's uh, single red blood cells in here, nice little capillary, but there's some material that's interposing itself in between, right? That shouldn't be there. So uh, not surprise, surprise, but here's our stains. This is a uh, sulfated alcium blue. It nicely highlights, it's actually a ton of material in there staining green. Uh, and then you can see the same thing on your uh, Congo red. And then that nicely shows you uh, this, this apple green birefringence. But again, in contrast to how much green you see here, and I, I just wanted to point that out again, you see there's a lot of green, right, on our, on our alcium blue there. But then when you look at the amount of actual uh, apple green birefringence, just a little bit right there, maybe a little there, maybe a little there. So it can be challenging sometimes to, to make these, these diagnoses. Um, so this patient actually did also have a history of ATTR type cardiac amyloidosis that was previously diagnosed and now it was in his lungs. Okay, so I want to talk about amyloid as an incidental finding because we mentioned sometimes there, you don't, you're not thinking about this from the clinical side and they get a biopsy. Um, so this is a patient who was coming in for a mitral valve repair. It's some myxomatous mitral valve disease. We got his, I got it as appendage and his mitral valve. All right, so here's his left atrial appendage. At first glance, does it look too, too crazy? You know, you al we always look to see if there's any fibrosis, any, you know, uh, hypertrophy of the myocytes, anything along those lines. Let's look a little closer. All right. So again, a little bit of vacuolization. And, you know, I wondered, you know, is there something in there? It looks a little bit off. And so decided to do uh, a Congo red on this particular one. And sure enough, uh, there's these very wispy, wispy congophilic material in between, okay? And then if you polarize it, this one actually was a beautiful polarization where we had a ton of, of uh, apple green birefringence there. I was like, okay. Then I looked at the valve and I was like, okay, here's the valve. All right, um, all this deep purple stuff is calcification. There's some fibrosis here. Um, there were some myxomatous changes in some of the other pieces, but I was like, you know, looking at some of the material, it's just, I, I just, I worried about this case. And so I threw a Congo red on this one as well. Um, let's look at this spot here. So this is the Congo red, and it's a little hard to tell uh, with the, all the calcification going on, but there actually is some Congophilia right here, right here, right here. And then when you look at the polarization, sure enough, apple green birefringence right there. So I sent for typing on this particular case uh, for actually both, and the left atrial appendage came back as uh, uh, atrial nitritic factor, or ANF type amyloid, and then the mitral valve came back as an indeterminate type of amyloidosis. Um, so, you know, it's probably out of the scope to talk too much about um, a, uh, ANF type amyloid, but certainly can have some 
uh, clinical implications and is important to know, but it's a different type of amyloid that was in that mitral valve. And likely uh, what was in the mitral valve uh, was probably just a lo associated with a localized degenerative process. But we do see this type of amyloid. Dr. Rosenthal can attest, I send her, end up sending patients her way by finding all this degenerative amyloid. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting you can see that. But this highlights how you can have different types of amyloid in the same patient depending on where you take the tissue in. So for this particular patient, it may or may not not have had significant imp impact, but in other patients, for example, uh, where you're worried about like an ATTR type and maybe you find something that's degenerative, um, looking at the actual organ that's impacted can be really important. So actually getting that cardiac biopsy. So you can have multiple types of amyloid. All right, so let's take a bit of a different path here. So let's look at a lung nodule in a 78-year-old man, okay? so. Here's his nodule, high power. So very pink, kind of amorphous material. There's a couple of uh, giant cells here and here, okay? And you're like, okay, this looks kind of like amyloid. Um, this was one of my consult cases, actually. And so the outside pathologist said, okay, it looks kind of like amyloid. Uh, I'm gonna do a Congo red. So they did a Congo red, eh, maybe congophilic, but nothing polarized, nothing there, okay? So they were like, the Congo red is negative. I don't know what this material is. And so they sent it out, which is totally reasonable. So what do we do next? So this is where those other stains actually come in very helpful. So when I get cases like this, I will add a sulfated alcium blue and a trichrome. And so this is what the sulfated alcium blue look like. Now, this is not that pretty toothpaste green, right? So this is the, this kind of like a salmon pinkish color, very different than what we saw in amyloid. And then here's a trichrome. We're not seeing bluish gray, we're seeing this bright fire engine red color. All right, so what does this tell us? So this tells us that the patient has light chain deposition disease. So this is not amyloid, it's not amyloidogenic, it's a monoclonal um, Ig deposition disease. You can rarely see it in the lung and heart, but it certainly has been reported. Renal involvement tends to be more common. Uh, the nodular form is associated with Sjogren's, low-grade lymphoma, plasma cell neoplasms. So light chain deposition disease, I feel like, is often missed. At least once every couple of months we get a case that comes through a consult where they're like, I don't, we don't know what this is, we're, we're just lost because the Congo red is negative. And it's one of the reasons why I really like seeing some of these additional special stains. Um, I think I have a chart here, yes. So this is amyloid versus light chain and what the very, very simple sulfated alcium blue trichrome. Um, the sulfated alcium blue, not all labs have this stain available for use, uh, but every pathology lab is gonna have trichrome. This is just a stain for fibrosis. It's used in a multitude of different scenarios. So everyone's gonna have a trichrome. So if you have a Congo red and a trichrome, you can pretty reliably say if something is going to be uh, light chain deposition disease or not. So the trichrome will give you that very distinctive crimson red in light chain in contrast to a blue gray color that you see in amyloid. And if you do have the sulfated alcium blue, you get a salmon pink in light chain versus that bright teal. So very different colors. There's no chance of sort of Mis misdiagnosing them because they look very, very different. Um, and then of course, Congo red and light chain could be focally positive or kind of weak looking, or it could just be completely negative. Uh, as a side, you can have amyloid and light chain deposition disease uh, in the same biopsy and in the same patient. That does happen, and you get a very nice mix of the two colors. Um, if you were to do electron microscopy, not as many people do EM anymore for this, um, but you would see a difference in, in EM. You get the nine to 10 nanometers randomly oriented fibrils for amyloid, of course, and then light chain looks more of like this kind of dense uh, powdery uh, deposits. Okay, so I did want to talk briefly about a hereditary amyloid transthyretin polyneuropathy, since I know that this was a, a topic that was being uh, pushed a bit here. I feel like it has been talked about in, in better detail than what I have on here. Certainly a progressive disease, very debilitating early diagnosis is key. Uh, what I will mention from the pathology uh, portion is that Biopsy is obviously very important in identifying these patients, but the biopsy is not always of the nerve, right? Um, and even if the patient does have a nerve biopsy that's negative, there may still be amyloid there. And so there's a lot of value in considering um, other biopsy sites, it's particularly if they do have systemic amyloidosis that's being deposited in other organs that may be affected and might be easier to get a biopsy from. Um, so certainly you can see that there. Uh, oftentimes though, I think, uh, fortunately, the, the burden on thinking about this is, is on you all first to figure it out. Uh, if we can find it, that's great. Um, we, can con we can confirm it and then send it for typing. 
All right, so again, same thing. Um, this, this, this was actually, this paper was talking about ATTR amyloidosis as hereditary, but I thought in their table, they nicely summarized essentially everything that I wanted to talk about with the issues associated with biopsy is that you can have false negatives um, you, depending on sampling, right? So amyloid is not everywhere. So even in that picture of the explanted heart that I showed you, not every piece of the heart was involved by amyloid, even though it was quite a severe case. In fact, I took a little piece of normal appearing myocytes from that picture to use as my normal myocytes for the picture uh, from the biopsy uh, from that patient. So sampling is everything, right? So if we're only getting one tiny piece, you may have missed the amyloid. Um, so consider, and then the other thing I did want to mention too, again, coming kind of harping on that point, is if you don't diagnose this a lot, or the laboratory that you're sending it to doesn't see this a lot, you know, consider asking, you know, could you send it out? Or did you do any additional special stains? Or maybe repeat the stain? Um, because I have seen more than one case come through our service where amyloid was either missed or it was called negative and it was clearly positive, um, things like that. So definitely there is a level of technical skill involved both in the laboratory side of running and creating these stains and then also in the interpretation side from the pathologist of interpreting those Congo red stains. All right, so I think that's my last slide. Hopefully I've caught us up on a little bit of time. Thank you.